Hello everyone. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that a couple of videos ago I dug out my old Yashica Minister 3 film camera and put a roll of expired colour negative film through it. And since then a couple of people have asked me um, questions about film development, in particular colour film development. So I thought, well, let's talk a little bit about what happens to your film, assuming that you don't process it yourself, when you've exposed it. Now, I come from a generation where the whole film processing market was completely different to what it is now. Uh, let's leave aside digital for a second. Um, going back to the 1970s, which is when I first started working for a colour processing laboratory, uh, <laughs> we used to handle literally thousands of films every day and they were collected from all over, in my case, North Wales, from holiday camps, from chemist shops, you name it. Uh, the vans would go around North Wales, picking up all the DMP, developing and printing orders, and bring them back to the laboratory for overnight processing. Um, and when you deal with huge quantities of film like that, you need huge equipment. I was quite fortunate in as much as while I was working there at uh, Real Photo Finishes, I was sent on a training course down to Kodak in Harrow, which at that time was an absolutely huge factory employing thousands of people. Um, I think I did mention it very briefly in a very early video of mine, um, what happened to Kodak. If I can dig that out, I'll put a link um, up here, up there, somewhere. Um, but over the following decades, and really coming into the 1990s, the whole processing industry had a sea change. The large developing laboratories, um, like the one that I started out in, um, became very cumbersome and uneconomical, uh, sending a van and driver out into the countryside to collect films uh, was time consuming and very expensive. And the advent of mini labs really spelt the death knell for the large processing laboratory. Uh, I was involved with a Kodak Express mini lab on the Wirral in the 1990s. And um, I'll come on to why my alternative title for this video could well be um, Lenses, Who Needs Lenses? But the big thing with mini labs is that you can offer one hour processing, and in actual fact, sometimes a lot quicker than one hour, um, which is what people began to insist upon in the 1990s. And of course there's this crossover point between film being dominant and digital encroaching on that existing market. So it was really paramount for uh, businesses processing film to actually move to a mini lab setup. Let's get back to what happens to your film. When you take your film in or send your film in to be processed, the first step is for the laboratory to make sure that they've got your details, i.e. name and address and phone contact number, uh, on an envelope. They pop your film into it and they mark both the envelope and your film. Now, um, they mark the film canister and they would normally mark the leader of your film itself with a numbered sticky label. That's to make sure that at the other end of the process, your negatives get married up with your envelope and your prints, assuming you want prints. Once the film has been opened from the canister, it's fed into a machine and 
back in the 90s, there were a lot of different manufacturers available. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that uh, probably Fuji Color, stroke Fuji Film, whatever you want to call them, are the dominant force in the market with their Frontier lineup of mini labs. Now, uh, I didn't opt for the Fuji system because they. Um, the footprint of a Fuji Frontier Lab is really quite large and the premises that I was managing was really quite small. So instead we opted for a mini lab manufactured by Gretag, which is a company that now long, no longer exists. But that had a very, very much smaller footprint and it was ideal for our particular setup. Another company um, back in the day would have been Agfa, Agfa Gevert and Noritsu. They were all manufacturing mini labs. Once your film goes into the C41 developer, which is the first part of the process, it is put through basically four baths. You have a developer, as you would probably expect, then you have a bleach then you have a fix, then you have a stabilizer, and depending on the setup, you might also have a final wash, which is one of the areas that can be, if you like, not necessarily eliminated, but cut down to save time. And I'll come on to this aspect of uh, cutting back on things as well, because it's quite important. Um, so you've got your negatives processed and they come out in a strip, as you might expect, and they then get transferred into the printing side of the mini lab, which uses um, C41 paper chemicals. And the paper side of things is not as critical. It's not as critical in both time and temperature. I think the development temperature for C41 negatives is around about 32, 35 degrees centigrade. Pretty warm. Um, there's more flexibility with the paper chemistry. And unlike the film, the paper processing chemistry side is a little bit simpler. You've got developer and then you've got bleach fix. So it's a combination of those two, uh, bleach and fix mixed together commonly referred to as Blix, and then a stabilizer. And that's basically it. And then your prints come out um, either on a roll, but certainly with the Gretag equipment, they were automatically chopped up. So depending on what size you'd ordered when you took your film in, they would be cut up into either um, six inch lengths or seven inch lengths depending on what you actually wanted. Six by fours, seven by fives, that kind of thing. The largest prints we could do on that machine were 12 by eight, more or less A4 in uh, metric size. Once your prints are out, they come out dried and um, perfectly presented, <laughs> at least that's the theory. Uh, and then they can be um, put into a wallet put back in your envelope and they are there ran and they are then ready for you to collect. Simple process. So that's what happens to your film when you take it into a one hour mini lab or when you send it off to be processed by mail order. Two stage process, get your negatives developed first of all, which is quite critical. Then they process your prints, which is less critical. The mini lab outfit that I was uh, managing was part of a defunct side of Kodak. I don't want this to be all about Kodak, by the way. It just so happens that I, I did work with Kodak for a while. I went training, etc., and I was involved with the Kodak Express mini lab system. The Kodak Express mini lab system was tightly monitored. And by that, I mean that they would have a representative who would come round at least every month, if not slightly more often than that, depending on where he lived. But he would visit us every month and he would check 
our uh, process control strips, which you, if you were doing the job properly, you would put a process control strip through the film side every day and through the paper side at least every week to make sure your chemistry was in balance. He would check our control strips. Not only that, he would go into our stock room and he would check the labels on, in particular, the paper that we were using. Um, obviously, if you're running under the Kodak Express banner with a nice big Kodak sign above your shop, they don't want you using Fuji paper or Agfa paper or something cheaper. And he would also check that we were using um, Kodak chemistry. Now, it's not difficult to keep a mini lab on track with regard to quality and process control, which is what it's all about. Um, the machine itself will give you readings from the test strips and tell you whether it is in limits or not, in which case you would have to uh, make adjustments depending on what it was. Um, but the less scrupulous <laughs> uh, Minilab operators would quite often uh, try and uh, get away with not replenishing chemicals as often as they should. Um, in particular, the most expensive chemistry when it comes to processing C41 negative film is the bleach, and, and that's on the film side, and bleach fix on the paper side. They are the most expensive chemicals. And if you are prepared to dilute them or not replenish them at the correct rate, then your quality can suffer greatly. Um, you can end up with negatives that really look very, very grainy in the case of your film processing. And in the case of the paper, then they're not going to be as um, stable in daylight as they would be if they've been bleach fixed and stabilized properly. So if you get negatives back and you look at them and you think, my God, that looks grainy that's a surefire sign that the bleach on the film processing side has been pretty poor. And I think to myself, hmm, did that affect my Fuji film that I used the other week? I don't know, probably not. Um, and if your prints start to fade or um, discolor, that's usually a good sign that they've not been fixed properly or stabilized properly. Um, I come, as I've already said, from a generation where the whole processing industry was very lab-centric. There were big laboratories, not very many of them, but there were big laboratories dotted all over the country. Uh, where I worked in North Wales, the laboratory actually covered the whole of North Wales. Holiday camps, um, retail shops, you name it. And the course that I went on down to Kodak was to learn how to use uh, a brand new enlarging printer, which they had made. Um, I think I've got a, an image of one of the um, uh, training manual sheets about it. Um, but the thing about that era is that everything is lens oriented. And this is where we come on to my alternate title. With that particular machine, um, if I was uh, enlarging from a 35 millimeter negative, I would use a 35 millimeter negative carrier. If I was producing a 10 by 8 print of a 35 millimeter negative, I would use one specific lens in its mount, and I'd have to physically take it out of a drawer and put it in the machine then produce the enlargement. If I was then doing the same 10 by 8 off a uh, 120 negative, two and a quarter inch square, for example, I would need to change the negative carrier and change the lens. So it would be lens out, in the drawer, new lens in, up in the machine, and so on. For those of you that have done your own enlarging at home, it's exactly the same process. Um, and it would also vary depending on the size of the enlargement. So if I was doing uh, a 14 by 11 inch print, which might sound a bit odd in today's market, but back in the day, 14 by 11s were a popular size and a conventional size. 
So if I was doing a 14 by 11 inch print, I would still use the same neg carrier for a two and a quarter square neg. I would still use the same lens, but the machine would alter the height of the paper and the lens so that it would refocus the lens and project the image up onto the larger piece of paper. I hope this kind of makes sense. But it was what I'm trying to say is that it was all about the lenses. Back in those days, I mean, we talk about lenses all the time, don't we, photographers? But back in those days, you couldn't produce a print without using a lens of some description, enlarging lenses. Suddenly, in the 1990s, when I'm faced with using a mini lab produced by Gretag, there's not a lens in the damn thing at all. Everything is done by laser. And I, it, took me, it took me a month or so to get my head around that. Because every time I was being presented with um, APS film or 110 film, which we were still processing in those days, 35 mil APS, 120, I would be sort of almost looking for a different lens to use. Not one single lens in the machine. And it's absolutely, it still blows my mind to this day, to be honest with you. Well, I hope that hasn't bored you to tears too much and that you're still awake. Hello, are you still there? Are you still with me? Good. <laughs> um, in the meantime, you know very well what I'm gonna say. I really do hope you continue to enjoy your photography, even though idiots like me bore you to death with films like this. Um, but in the meantime, take care of yourselves and I'll see you all very soon. Bye for now.